One, two, one, two, three, four. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. We've got a really interesting show for you this week. We've got Chris and Donna Donato, and they have started a consulting movement focused on bringing buyers and sellers to the same side of the table. And it's called the same side movement, the same side movement. So Donna works at American Express in their procurement department. And Chris is a consultant, but used to be an enterprise seller. If you want to understand what procurement is thinking about and how to navigate procurement and how to use com- procurement to your advantage, this is the episode for you. Now, before we get there, we want to thank our sponsors. The first is Chorus.ai, the leading conversation intelligence platform for high growth sales teams. It records, transcribes, and analyzes business conversations in real time to coach reps on how to become top performers. With Chorus.ai, more reps meet quota, new hires ramp faster, leaders become better coaches, dogs become more behaved and only urinate in the appropriate place, and everyone in the organization can collaborate over the actual voice of the customer. In all seriousness, Chorus is a fantastic platform. The entire category is fantastic. You need a solution like Chorus if you've got a sales team, because there's no other way to figure out what they're saying unless you have a solution like Chorus. So I highly encourage you to check it out. Check out chorus.ai forward slash sales hacker to see what they're up to. Our second sponsor is Outreach. That's Outreach.io, the leading sales engagement platform. Outreach supports sales reps by enabling them to humanize communications at scale, from automating the soul-sucking manual work that eats up selling time to providing action-oriented tips on what communications are working best Outreach has your back. Now, coming up in March, Outreach is running Unleash 2019. It's the sales engagement conference. It's going to be the definitive sales engagement conference. It's going to be a fast, fantastic thing. March 10th through 12th, San Diego. I will be there. Many people will be there. Uh, Max will be there. Manny will be there. Listeners of the pod get $100 off simply for entering the code SHPOD. So hop over to unleash.outreach.io and use the code SHPOD to save $100 off your ticket. It's going to be amazing. So uh, without further ado, let us listen to uh, this edition of the Sales Hacker Podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everybody. It's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. We've got a very special episode today. We've got the first time we've ever had two people on at the same time. And not only are they two people, but they're two very tightly connected people because they're married. So this is going to be super, super exciting. The two folks that we've got on the show today are Chris and Donna Donato. Now, Donna comes from uh, American Express, and she's going she's gonna to let us know that the views she expresses are her own, and she is not speaking on behalf of that multi-billion dollar conglomerate. But she's VP of Strategic Sourcing and Business Enablement for Global Supply Chain Management at American Express. And Chris is the founder of Ecellus, which is a consulting organization, but most recently he was VP of Global Sales at DXC, where he was responsible for sales and revenue of the company's $1.2 billion business process services unit. Now, they're not just a husband and wife duo, but they come at sales, particularly enterprise sales, from opposite sides of the table. They represent buyer and seller. Uh, I guess Donna's Russian, so they represent Russian and American, which is a very uh, important combination in this day and age. And they're going to talk to us about strategies for sales when you're working through a procurement process with a large enterprise, which is something that we all struggle with and deal with on an ongoing basis when you're in enterprise sales. So I think it's going to be an incredible show. They call this movement the same side movement. So Chris and Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you. This is really exciting to be part of the community and the opportunity to speak to your audience. And the nice introduction, Sam. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. So I gave a little bit of a background on both of you, but it would it's always nice to get introductions. You know, I gave the 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 headline and the title, but Chris and Donna, tell us who you are, what your experience is, and then we'll dive into, you know, into the topic of the day. Fantastic. Um, how about I start? So yeah. I'm Donna uh, D. Uh, Donato, and um, I've been a buyer pretty much all of my life, uh, even though I've probably stumbled into this as a profession, you know, unexpectedly. But if you think about it, we are buyers in everything we do, right? From the selection of our home to all the daily decisions to more complex ones. So I love it. I love buying on a daily basis. I love it as my profession. Um, as you mentioned, I came from Russia uh, to uh, initially to study to the United States, you know, because I sourced pretty good opportunity, I would say. You know, I scored a full-time scholarship, so who could turn down education for free? 
that was my first probably really good lesson, you know, on when you see a good deal, take it. And um, that's how I uh, started my life here in um, in America. After that, I um, joined a number of companies, um, you know, large uh, healthcare, uh, pharma um, companies, and then uh, American Express, as you mentioned, in various roles running, establishing um, strategic sourcing procurement organizations and managing, you know, billions of dollars of spend, solving business problems and really enjoying it. Great. And uh, this is Chris. Um, like Donna, I've been doing my, I've, I, I have had this chosen profession probably since about the third grade. Then it was uh, magazines and candy door to door. And then it became mega deals and, uh, and large uh, global relationships. Uh, I've, I've worked for some of the largest companies, HP, Accenture, and have, uh, have had my own uh, hand at startups. And again, as you mentioned, I, I've started a company a few months ago called Ecellus. I'm always in some form or fashion in sales and growing businesses. It's great to have you both on the show. So walk us through, your working on this, on this concept called the same side movement. So walk us through the core tenets, the core principles, and just give us an idea of this philosophy when it comes to you know, bringing together buyer and seller. Yeah, I mean, uh, and and it originated honestly for uh, f- you know around the dinner table. Don and I, and I have been together for twelve years, and every day we're sharing stories. It started with frustration, sort of, <laughs> yes. why do you do this and why do you do that? And it became really, we, we became much better at what we did, b- buying or selling, as we learned from one another and listened to you know the other side. So that was kind of the core, and we thought, well, we're really we're really learning and becoming more effective. How can we kind of turn this into something, codify it? We're seeing between the two of us, we structured hundreds of deals and have been responsible for billions of dollars of, of transactions or relationships. So, and, and we didn't see this conversation happening. So yeah. we started to put together a, a platform and some and some core principles. Yeah, but I, I think that's so spot on. You know, the frustration is what led us to revelation. And uh, I remember so many conversations. It was like, why do you do this to us? You know, and Chris would be the, would, would ask the same question. Why does procurement, you know, create this roadblocks and ask so many questions? So uh, when we unpacked it, you know, there are really three things that fundamentally we thought if we could change will make our interactions just much more uh, productive and enjoyable. So I said, look, you got to be purposeful and mindful really about everything that you do. You know, I had my list of grievances and frustrations with the sales process and the sales interactions. So did Chris. We also said that how often we step into an office and forget that we're humans, right? And really approach a transaction from such a, um, a kind of gamemanship almost perspective, you know, and we forget that we need to really think from personal, you know, yes, we say business is not personal, right? It's just business. It's not personal, but it really is understand who's motivated, why, uh, what drives the transaction. So we, we thought that we should really anchor on that and then build trust. Trust is everything. And uh, if we really unpack the concept of trust, we anchored on transparency as being the major driver of trust in any relationship. So we said, you know, radical transparency, it's something that we would yeah. like to push for because that, you know, consistently yielded as better results in any you know negotiation relationship etc so if we're chris if we're if we're if we want to to the point of uh d's comments unpack on face value these can be i don't mean to belittle them they're great they're great values but they're but they're somewhat you know uh broad so how do we be specific when you say be mindful about your approach and actions give us an example of somebody not being mindful or or you know, making a mistake and then what a good practice would be, particularly when it comes per, to buyers dealing with sellers, procurement dealing with salespeople? Yeah, perfect. Good question. So let's take mindful. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of pressure to do more, more outreach, you know, cast a wide net, cover, a, a, a you know, a large territory and see what comes back. So I'll, so I'll just take mindful in the, in the sense of just, you know, getting, uh, you know, the relationship started and finding that, that right target. I see, we all see, we, you, you can go on LinkedIn any day and see people griping about the impersonal approach to, to prospecting. It's as if you're not thinking through it. You're not, you're not mindful about who you're, who you are approaching. And most importantly, why, um, you know, with the, the sort of the common anecdote for that is we'll do your homework. 
Well, so let's take that deeper. What does that mean, do your homework? It's beyond personalization of a message. How many sellers out there are listening to earnings calls, reading 10Ks, diving deeply into a prospective customer's business to really look for those pain points and have evidence of those pain points and using all of that insight into a very thoughtful, mindful reason why you think you can help this customer you know, a, a solve a problem or achieve an opportunity. That alone isn't happening. So that's just one small example of just going into this with a, with a clear strategy. Be very, very mindful about why are you approaching this customer? Why do you think you're going to help, et cetera? That, that's yeah. what I'm No, I'm just going to add, you know, maybe simple with not to do. So a day in the life, I'll give you, you know, as a procurement professional, I get emails, uh, I mean, every single day from companies saying, we need to meet. And um, I, I used to just ignore them if I just looked at them, scanned them and said they're irrelevant, you know, from what I thought at the first glance. But I started actually responding and very quickly just you know, firing right back. Tell me why. It, it's really basic, you know, when to say, why should it, and some of them I would say specifically, you're asking for my time. It's really precious, you know, so let's be thoughtful for both of us not to waste time. Tell me why should we meet? And uh, if you don't start with that kind of end in mind, you know, that you want to get to a meaningful conversation, then you really frustrated the buyer. Yeah, Sam, I think the message for for that seller and I look, we we all have we all have empathy for that person that's on the front line. I know a number of listeners are in, in an SDR type role. Um, and they are under pressure to go and do more. But more should be more depth, not more not not cast a wider net. So that's just one example of kind of being mindful in your approach. So, Chris, when you're talking about SDRs, you know, one of the reasons that th they're trying to do more is because they have specific, you know, they have specific targets in there. So we, we understand that there needs to be a level of personalization. Now, the, the, one of your, your third principle is strive for a radical level of transparency. Tell us what you mean by that, particularly when it comes to, you know, this, it, what types of transparency should we be striving for? And, and what's an example of not looking for that same degree of transparency? Or what's an example of a bad practice? Look, I, I think uh, we, we have a tendency to want to tell a compelling story and be bold. And again, it's cultural. It's kind of the uh, the business we operate in, and uh, you know we like to uh, make certain claims of of savings savings we can drive or big claims about what our product can do. I think I think that is a that is a that is not a level of transparency. That's that's just sort of bold for being bold and and trying to grab attention. I think on on the other side of that is sort of you know. Uh, being more clear about what your capabilities can and cannot do, how you f how you fare against the competition. Maybe even it could be in a competitive situation where you fall short to a competitor, uh, a competitor's capabilities. We we have a tendency to want to just fly through an objection or or you know skate over a potential blemish in the capability that we might have or a, or a negative review i think those are opportunities where you actually can be human be real be transparent and actually you know develop a higher degree of trust with your customer that you're being you're being open and transparent okay donna when when you're tell us about you know you mentioned people say you know you we i'd like to set up a meeting and you say why do you want to meet I think that's interesting that people are reaching out to somebody in procurement. Uh, normally, procurement sort of like in the middle to end of the process. But it is interesting because we don't have somebody from procurement on the phone all the time, uh, you know, in the podcast. What is your day-to-day -day like? What are your key challenges? You know, what are your pain points? If we want to craft a message that's relevant to somebody in your position, what should that message be? That's a good question. Um, I look at my function, first of all, you know, as this connector, uh, of external capability to the business. So my team every day, you know, sits with our business partners internally to figure out what's important and how external capability can help solve for the business challenge or create an opportunity. So my um, value is really driven by bringing the most relevant, capable suppliers to the table that can deliver. 
So the more I know what's going on, especially from the competitive you know, landscape um, standpoint, the more I understand you know, how certain solution could differentiate it, how it could fit into our ecosystem, that will be, le- that will be relevant. Cost savings you know, is one of the levers, but it's not the most important one, even though I think we have really bad rap you know, associated with driving this cost savings and uh, negotiating hard on just pure cost. I think the procurement function has really been evolving to be that value at part and trusted part to the business. So the more you could help me to establish that credibility with a business that will help to move you know, the needle, that's what I'm looking for. So you're looking for inf- information and, and you know, sort of like market intelligence, does that help you become a more valuable partner back to the organization? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it starts with information and then insight. You've talked about this sometimes uh, within your own organization, getting your finger on the pulse of of, of who's operating with that in the organization, what kind of capabilities you, you have a, a you know, a, a hand, um, good knowledge of it. But if, when, when salespeople bring to you that insight, Hey, we connect to this, this system, we, we fit into that ecosystem and you're using it in this part of your business, that level of internal insight you've found to be very valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's an internal and external insight. Actually, that's helpful then to package together. And then in turn, you know, be very transparent with the, you know, sales, uh, you know, individuals to say, okay, this is where you fit, you know, whether it's really worth wait, you know, spending your time here or not. And Sam, we, we, you know, just this point of, of use, you, you mentioned uh, procurement, where they fall in the, in the kind of the buying process traditionally. And uh, what Don is driving, and I meet a lot of procurement leaders and professionals that are driving a different agenda. And I, I would bring, I, I've run large sales organizations that I mentioned that I'd bring Donna in to present to us, to talk about what's going on for, for that procurement, that kind of, I'd say a, a, a more progressive procurement mindset. It, we're all looking for that entry point, right? And we all, we know as sellers that uh, we're having to interact with many more people in a, in a particular purchase. So you've got, you know, you, you've got to figure out, well, where, where is a, where's a great place to start? I'd, I'd encourage this, you know, the, you know, listenership to think about how finding that, that sort of progressive mindset in, in, in procurement on their, in their customer base and leverage that resource. Don't wait for it to happen at the end. Mm-hmm. Leverage that resource, meaning to your point, reach out to procurement, develop a relationship. Does that, am I interpreting that correctly? You are. Yeah, that's exactly right. Are there, um, you know, one of the, this, this is, sorry for being a little tactical, but, um, you know, it's coming directly from personal experience. Are there pricing models from your perspectives that are in favor or out of favor as it relates to how a supplier should present their pricing back to an enterprise solution. And I say that because there have been situations where, you know, many SaaS businesses present their fees as a recurring revenue and many enterprises are still requesting sort of a one-time perpetual license plus professional services. How do you both see that landscape evolving just in terms of how companies are presenting the commercial model through which they deliver their services? It depends. I would say I probably don't have, you know, the stats at my fingertips to see kind of which direction we're tipping into. But I, I mean, I see deals, you know, of both, um, you know, kind of structure. And it depends on what we're trying to accomplish at any given, you know, transaction. So trying to find out the real outcome, you know, what's the, you know, we're, we're, what we're trying to do and kind of why they would be asking for those pricing models, you know, differently uh, is probably most important. Yeah, and I think I think you got to think about usage as well. So you know, obviously, a, a large organization is going to you know carefully consider what 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 will they consume. Uh, yeah. The lure of this whole SA- the evolution of SaaS and cloud has said, well, it's going to drive down cost. I don't necessarily know that that's yeah. true. Uh, it's certainly easier to digest in a light, you know, per seat license model, but there are plenty of firms out there that um, have sold that model to an enterprise customer. I, and I want to say probably knowing that, hey, they're, there's, they're, you know, they're going to run up a big ticket and only later to come around and look for, for sort of, uh, uh, hey, you owe us. You've, you've, you've over-consumed what, yeah. what you, you thought. So I think it's, it's again, back to building those models and, and being transparent about it. But yeah. I think also in general, if I were to say that 
I mean, we're looking for unlimited enterprise wide license, you know, yeah. that covers everything at the, the best possible cost. Right. Uh, I mean, you, you want to make sure there's no surprises, none of those kind of audits, you know, driven, um, you know, remedy, you know, recoveries that, that hit yeah. you in a couple of years. So ideally, yeah, we would like to have, you know, an enterprise unlimited license. That's kind of, you start there and, uh, not every project, you know, deserves that level of uh, probably enterprise. Um, it's just not necessary, you know, consideration. But those are kind of the general principles. You don't want to be on the end. What's your level of appetite for, again, another observation from personal experience, which is there's sometimes a disconnect between the business unit's desire for innovation and the overall purchasing process at the enterprise, which is long labored and capital intensive. And so as a consequence, really the only companies that can make their way through an 18 or 24 month sales cycle, if that's what it is sometimes, are the companies that almost definitionally do not present innovation. They present uh, a big balance sheet with which they can weather the vicissitudes of the enterprise uh, buying process. So how do you balance the tension between the reality that innovation is coming from small companies that probably need to do business in a reasonable time frame versus uh, the realities of the requirements, both from a security and regulatory perspective, that come with being a Fortune 100 customer. Yeah, we I mean, talk about this a lot. Go yeah, because you hit on a really, really good and very relevant point. So, it's a big question because it's not just the business, but the procurement. You know, would want to drive innovation as well. But we also have a tremendous responsibility to make sure that we're not introducing, you know, undue risk that could not be mitigated. Right. So. Part of the so there are two parts I would say to the you know RFP process. One is figuring out is this is this the right solution and that will drive innovation and you know move the business forward, and that part I think is something we can actually probably assess relatively painlessly, right? So. But then there's a whole element of how does this fit into an ecosystem? What are the risks that this could potentially trigger? And I think, you know, in all of the different industries that I worked in you know, on farm and financial services, you have all the different pillars, you know, that could potentially be triggered and it's our responsibility to 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 guard it, right? So any transaction in that sense introduces triggers, you know, this level of review and it's our duty to review that most efficiently. And it's an interesting strategy question as a seller, do you, um, you know, win the hearts and minds of the business, get them very excited about the capability, knowing that you're going to need a lot of inertia to overcome the, you know, the, the challenges of selling within a large company and all that, you know, all the antibodies that attack the new innovative thing. So, so one strategy is, well, let me get the business really riled up and excited and find that champion that can quite honestly, you can drive something through an organization. You're going to need that. But you know, I've seen I've seen you know sellers try that, but then ig- then ignore the rest of the e- you know that internal buying ecosystem, which I think is 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 not a smart strategy. At the right time, you have to work with the buyer to figure out okay, this has implications to other systems, to other to other departments, to and 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 partnering with your buyer, your business buyer, to figure out where those potential integration points uh, challenges are early because. Too often, how many times have you heard this, Sam? You know, somebody has that business buyer, and they and they and, and they both, you know, they really want that deal, but they can't get it through their own organization. You know, Donna works for, I know this, this you know, this prestigious organization that that is, you know, built. It's taken many, 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 many years to build this brand. There's nothing that this firm will do to put that brand at risk. You as a seller have to be thinking, what risks do I introduce? Mm -hmm. You got to think about that early and often and and often think about how are you helping the buyer address them, mitigate those risks. That's got to be part of your plan. That makes sense. That's a really good point. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Here's a question that a lot of young companies don't get a chance to ask as they, as they try to pursue an enterprise opportunity, which is what and Donna, you don't have to, um, obviously we understand you're not a spokesperson for American Express, but based on your years of experience, both of your collective experience, there's a framework that is presented to the seller, meaning to the vendor, as these are our requirements. And in my experience, many of those non-negotiable requirements are in fact negotiable. So when you think about the non-negotiables, the true non-negotiables, and the areas where it's policy, but uh 
not a savvy, but you know, a, an informed vendor understands where the parameters are and where the flexibility is. Can you give us some examples or some ideas so that if somebody's out there listening, they, they understand what's a real roadblock and what's something where they need to get creative. That might be like SOC 2 or some kind of security audit that maybe you need or, or maybe you can, maybe you just flagged as like a higher risk vendor up through the security and, pro- and procurement process. So walk us through, you know, what's non-negotiable and what's negotiable and give us maybe some specific examples when you're encountering a sophisticated enterprise buyer. Yeah, I, I thought your question is kind of almost two part, right? One is really non negotiable in the risk assessment part. And then the other one is around the requirements for the solution itself, right? Because you also get pretty specific requirements often in an RFP for how you need to respond, right? Right. I mean, I, yeah, and I mean more specifically the sort of the former, which is the, you know, again, speaking just again, this is maybe like so personal that it's embarrassing, you know, it's uh, it's like I'm reading my diary. But <laughs> the, the point is that, you know, a young company, a company that's only a couple years old, they're not going to have a SOC, they might not have a SOC to audit. A vendor might say, give us three years of audited financials. And they'll say, we've been around for three years and we certainly are not going to spend our precious capital hiring PwC yet. We'll get there. So when it comes to just the ability to buy from a company, putting aside the requirements of the business solution, what do you perceive to be non-negotiable and what, where are their flexibility? Where have you seen flexibility in the buying process? So I would say anything that has to do with data and privacy, you know, the company handles customer data. It's, you know, this is the topic, and I think not just in the industry, but in the world, you know, is uh, is pretty critical. So those would be non-negotiable, right? So any kind of risk in the system that um, potentially expose customer data to any kind of a breach, I would say that's a hot button. For other items, such as financial stability, like you mentioned, I think those could be more uh, negotiable. So they're not necessarily checkbox just to see, yes, we got your three years audited financials, but more, let's have a conversation. And I often have, you know, so suppliers very effectively volunteer, you know, their CFOs or some other senior leaders to get on the phone and really talk through some things that are not in the public, you know, the main op- domain, obviously, but not even, you know, maybe backed up by, you know, a, a CPA kind of firm. So um, I think financials is something because you can also more creatively structure a deal that could help a company not fail. And that's one of our goals is the not just to get to a contract, but to get to a sustainable, good relationship. I would say financials are more um, negotiable. Reputational risk, data privacy risk, I would say not negotiable and should really be understood probably up front. When you say reputational risk, tell us what would be examples of sort of bad reputational risk? You know, there's uh, we probably look at some of the labor practices. It's really important, I think, for companies, global enterprises, you know, to make sure that, you know, there is no surprise on how, um, you know, supply chain is really kind of managed, where materials have been sourced, you know, the, you know, and, and ethical practices in the supply chain. But we'll definitely dig into those, especially if there's manufacturing involved. Uh, so I'd say reputational risk from that standpoint. That makes sense. You know, and any of these introduced are opportunities for understanding why they need the three years of audited financials. What is it that they're, what what risks are they seeing? And this may be one-on-one stuff like around negotiating or, or just even getting to, 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 a, to a, you know, good place. But any of those present opportunities to understand, well, what's driving it? And, and maybe there's another way we can solve the risk that you've identified by not giving three years of financials, but, but, but in some other, some other way to address whatever the risk you, you know, the customer presented. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think in, in general, those are, you know, you've been, I know you and many firms I've worked with have the openness to, okay, but you got to get underneath. If you're talking to someone, it's policy. Well, of course you're talking to the wrong person. You got to get above the, Hey, that's just here's our why. policy too. Mm-hmm. Here's why that policy is in place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, again, it's probably uh, it's refreshing for, or, or hopefully encouraging for some people to hear because I think some people, A, don't realize that there's might be a different person to talk to. And two, they don't realize that anything that they're being presented is possibly negotiable. Totally agree on reputational risk and, and certainly data privacy. Chris, when you're thinking about, you know, Donna mentioned the RFP process, it's her job to, and this is where, you know, let's get to the same side on this. It's her job to present to the business an accurate assessment of the ecosystem's capabilities, which means that she does not want to present just one vendor. She needs to make sure that, 
you know, that the, at least the procurement team is doing their due diligence and saying, there's four major players in the space. We've looked at all of them. They all filled out the RFP, et cetera. So what's your response, particularly a, for example, when you're receiving an RFP and you, and by definition, you're going to be in a competitive process. Some companies don't even fill out RFPs. What's your approach to the RFP process? And how do you ensure that when you know you're in a competitive sale, you're still positioning yourself in the best possible way? It's such a, it's an important question. I came from a business. uh, My last firm was uh, uh, DXC Technologies, twenty you know five billion dollar company that did a a lot of RFP responses. And then there's this wave of 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 sentiment that came through. It said we're not responding to RFPs anymore. And however, you know I've you know been part of lots of different opportunities that started with an RFP, often a blind RFP. I, I do think look, there's some telltale signs that an RFP is actually a a real smoke signal from a buyer that there's a problem. And uh, part of that is the level of access that you're you're getting from the organization that you're selling to. If it's if you see that, hey, you know, you can't talk to anybody else in the organization, they're warning signs. Are they, you know, are they really looking for uh, looking to get the, the right solution, or are they really trying to control? Is, is it a is it a spreadsheet exercise? So I think you know right away it's just okay. I've got an RFP. My first reaction is going to be all right. There's a smoke. This this is a this is a sign a company has a problem. Until I learn otherwise, I, I you know then there are, you know there are vendor forums as a kind of a next step in some cases with RFPs. I know people go into those processes and say okay. You know, let's keep let's just keep our questions to a minimum. Let's because I don't want to give away some competitive insight that I might have. I actually teach and coach just something opposite that says when you go into those open forums and you're bidding, I, I want to be the most knowledgeable person in the room. I, if I have insight that I could share, regardless of whether my competition has it or not, and and that means even an incumbent sharing information that they may have. I think that positions you in a better light, that you're out to solve the client's problem, that you have the insight. So, you know, I, I really coach being, you know, going into these RFP processes, believing, okay, this is this client has good intent, they have a problem until I learn otherwise. Um, and, and you can see that throughout the process when you're not getting the kind of access, you're not getting the information you know, that, that helps you form a solution when you try to veer off the road and, and offer them an alternative proposal. If they stick you right back into, no, there's, there's forms and there's spreadsheets. Again, another warning sign that you're, you know, you might be column fodder. So if, if you're getting that, those warning signals, does that mean bail out and just say, sorry, uh, we're not going to complete the RFP because, you know, sometimes you're getting it from American Express, you want American Express as a customer, and you're probably terrified that if you say, you know, take a hike, that it's going to reflect poorly on you. I do. Th- I think um, it isn't a, a you know a um, black and white no answer. Uh, I do. Uh, what I often hear when people do turn down an RFP, one of the reasons they cite is, well, we don't think uh, we're positioned to win. Uh, we're not, you know, w- which is why we're bailing out. I mean, I think. You know, again, no is a very powerful tool in sales. We don't use it enough. I think we like to chase a lot of different things, especially when you see an important logo out there. But it is, it, you know, it's a clear yellow light. Slow down, voice the concern. You know, I'm trying to develop a solution that exactly meets the needs of the business, and here's where I think I'm going to fall short of that. And uh, based on how you're you're organizing this process. I'd like to be able to do it, and here's what I would ask in return for my investment of my time and my team's my team's resources. And it, you you paint it a very clear. Here's what's in it for you. Here's what I need. I think very very early, and often we have to. Don and I talk about this. You have to you know create a two way street. We often feel on you know that it's often a one way street. You know you're the important brand, and you're going to dictate the rules of of how all this is all going to work. Well. You know, you've got to cleverly, you know, uh, authentically figure out. Okay, how do I establish? Here's a, here's what I need in the process in order to give you what it is that you're looking for, and that's a dialogue. And if you're not if you're not having that dialogue, and or they're not willing to entertain it, that is a clear red light. Yeah, let's go. Cool. There we go. Worth the price of admission because what I'm hearing is ask for access and ask for dialogue, and if you can't get either one then score the deal negatively. At least don't don't commit it to your forecast. 
Yeah, perfect. Um, so when bad. you're when you, <laughs> what are your best tips or, or recommendations? Lots of companies out there trying to sell to the enterprise. They hope that you know maybe they have like a two year sales cycle, and they hope that bringing in a VP of sales or some sales leader or commercial leader will will shorten the sales cycle. So you know, is that a false hope? And if it's not a false hope, what are the things that companies can do, particularly growth companies, to make sure that the vendor, I mean, the, 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 the purchaser, that the customer meets the criteria, meets the deadlines, and that the process stays on track so that they can commit this deal and forecast the deal. I did, let, you want, I'll start on this, on, the, on the, uh, what, what a oh, senior yeah. mm-hmm. leader can do. And I think if you're hiring somebody, when I, when I think about hiring for that level of a, of a leader, it's, it's, um, one is uh, just that, that level of experience. They've been through the enterprise buying process. So we, we know it's not a straight line. We know there's always surprises. There are always challenges. They're navigating these large organizations. It is, it is m- more than an art form. You know, there is a, there is, um, it, it requires a lot of experience when, when, when this thing happens, uh Oh, it's not time to, you know, to, to panic, you know, here's, here's the work around or work through that, you know, that situation. So I do think, look, if you're hiring a, a, a vice president of sales, I think you're going to want to know, and, you're, and your target is enterprise clients. I'd like to understand the track record and who they've sold to and, and, and dissect a deal, because I think that's important that a, that is a head of sales can help you navigate that. And it will improve speed, no question, uh, if, they've, if they've done that before. And of course, you know, a head of sales is going to bring in the kind of talent um, around him or her that, that has had similar experiences. I do think betting, putting it on the back of one individual is a is a is a um, dangerous strategy i do see this and um you know there's some there's um some great companies out there with great capability they've built this you know this this new thing and they think the answer is okay let me just hire the the sales horsepower without really understanding what it takes to get the market. So if you're going to hire that sales leader, the, the, the CEO and the, the, first, the, you know, the group that hires them has to understand what it takes and give them that, you know, that, that air cover in the room to operate. But I also, um, you know, we all know, I, I you know, hope we believe that selling is no longer an individual sport. It's a team sport. So bringing, you know, a, a good sales leader will orchestrate a selling engine that includes uh, you know, a team on his and his or her side that includes leadership, that includes different people along that buyer journey. So, I don't know if that directly answered your question. I think you know, um, um, they're just you know initial thoughts. One thing to add there, I don't know if you were going there as well. In terms of bringing somebody in front of a client or potential client, I don't think the title, you know, kind of our escalation is going to matter. You know, the VP of sales or SVP of sales for special smaller companies does not make that much of a difference. What matters is, are they adding something, you know, of an expertise or credibility to the process yeah. and can help actually to manage the process, you know, with, with stamina that it will require, you know, for this company to stay in it and keep it, you know, kind of engage in and alive and add something. And I think that's what I shared in one of my articles, you know, so add something, you know, of inj- kind of inject, you know, an additional point of view or a bit another insight, you know, uh, that, that's that would be helpful for client to make a decision, but not just for the sake of like seniority. That doesn't really matter as much unless the person has relationships and, uh, you know, can help really navigate the enterprise. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together. So I have just a few more questions. This has been a great conversation. One of the things that you've, you've talked about in the past is that this moment between buyers and sellers in the enterprise is fundamentally changing and we need to rethink how we sell, how we go to market, and specifically procurement and sales need each other in this new paradigm. So I guess my very simple question is why? Why do sales and procurement need each other? And what what value is each side providing to the other? Let me talk about that in somewhat of a metaphor. Uh, you know, we think about selling as uh, the traditional metaphor is like the hunter or the herder or the, 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 the farmer, you know, the kind of, you know, that, uh, that, that's sort of the mental model. And that's a sort of this, you know, s- uh, lone ranger that's out on their own doing, doing, you know, performing some sales motion. I think there's a very different metaphor and it, and it looks more like herding. And, uh, 
it, it's imagine, you know, you, what you're doing is you're leading a, gr a, a group of people from point A to point B. And you want to get them over probably a very rough terrain and you want to get them there safely. And to do that, you can't do that alone. You're, you're going to need a team, but you're going to need a team from both sides of the, of the table, so to speak. So I believe if you find the right, you know, the, the, the right orchestrator on the buy side, uh, and I think that can often be a procurement who has a broad holistic perspective, imagine you as the curator seller the seller as the curator of this buying experience teaming with someone on the other side and moving this this group of buyers from again from from point a to point b that's what i mean it's all changing so so you got to think about it in that context yeah i mean it's angry you should see chris's hand gestures here so um i think it just angered you know so many other questions that you've asked you know that the world is just getting more complex actually you know even though we're introducing all kinds of technology there's also introduction of many risks the ecosystem that we all operate is very complex i mean thinking when i think of my process map of what it takes yeah. to deal from idea to purchase is massive in terms of the inputs and people you need to talk to and uh, uh, you know sell it to and get input from. So having a Sherpa, really, you know, on the inside, you want that. And there are mutual benefits for procurement because that's our remit is to provide value to the enterprise. And the way to do it is to bring the best capabilities, how I know it, if I have the right trusted partner on the other side, that in a transparent and effective way can help us, you know, Get, get somewhere. And that's a message, uh, Sam, for the sellers that are on that front line. It's hard. And I know that, you know, every day in and day out, it's, it's, you know, that question, did I move the needle? Did I, did I advance the ball? Um, they should understand the complexity of this. Uh, and that's why I use that metaphor that, that the complexity of moving these buyers and how much of a team effort is required, the how, how, you know, how challenging it can be. They shouldn't get discouraged, but they should recognize, I got to have stamina. I have to have a plan. I have to have a team. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. Last, last question before we sort of, uh, we have a segment where we uh, try to pay it forward. And so we want to talk about some of the people that have influenced you and some of the books that you've read. But before we get there, one of the things that you've said to me in the past is change your version of more. So walk us through, you know, what that means to you. And when you say that, what are some of the ideas that, you know, that you want us to rethink when I think a lot of your themes are don't just go, don't just do more, but do it more specifically. So walk us through what that means. Yeah, and I guess I'm, I'll probably go back to that um, earlier example about more outreach, so to speak. And um, I love a lot of the technology that exists in the market right now to help improve that in, that initial engagement. I'd be I'm I'm you know optimistic that it's going to actually improve outreach versus just sort of that spray and pray. So more would be let me cast a wide net, and so go wide and see who see who reacts. That's the, I think, an older definition of more. And we see, look, that kind of, you know, that broad way of going about it perpetuates, unfortunately, the negative perception of sales and marketing, that we're pesky and persistent and, and not thoughtful. So the more, the new more would be more research, more homework, more time spent, you know, developing a relationship, more time spent helping a customer you know, uh, manage that buying journey. More would be not more first meetings, but we don't talk enough about more second meetings. You know, me I'd measure second meetings versus and conversion versus measuring, you know, how much activity I have at the top of the funnel. Those are the, some sort of thoughts on that changing the definition of more. Makes a lot of sense. Chris and Dee, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, first of all, let, let's talk about who your influences are. So if we, if we want to understand who inspired you or if there are certain books or, uh, or pieces of content that, you know, you want us to know about because you think they've informed, you know, your worldview, tell us who are those people, what are those pieces of content so that we can, you know, we can get better and we can improve. So I'll use two and then I'll mention a book, but um, I wrote this article on LinkedIn and I got a lot of feedback around it. It was, it was uh, entitled, entitled the best boss I ever had. Uh, his name was, uh, is Sean Donovan. And uh, he was a sales leader at a, at a very 
pivotal point in my career. It, it was I was uh, I was you know having my fair share of struggles um, in, in the role that I was in, and I had worked on a on a deal for a long time. And in the article, it describes what happened to me. But um, the reason he was he was so impactful is he stood up for me in a time, and I, and, and I wrote it now because I'm hearing too many. Uh, I'm getting too many calls from too many people saying, gosh, I'm not getting the support that I need. Look, we are in a tough business and you need air cover. You need time. And I, and I hope that's not changing, but I am seeing winds of it. We're, we're, lo- we're lacking patience. And if, you know, if there's a sales leader on, the, on this uh, who's listening to the podcast, my article says, find the courage, fight the good fight for your people to, to, to sell with confidence. When they, when they play scared and sell scared, it's, it affects everything. So Sean was that. A uh, person who looked after me at a very important part of my career and, and made a big difference. Uh, the other is I played uh, basketball in college for a guy named Speedy Morris. And uh, Where, where'd uh, you play? Where'd you play basketball? It was a uh, LaSalle University, uh, okay. small Catholic school in Philadelphia. I was a walk on on the team, and and Speedy. The, the reason I bring up him is is a couple things. He tre- I was the thirteenth man. And he treated me like Lionel Simmons, who was our, who was the number one player in the country that year that I that I was there. So it was about how you treat people, whether you're the starter or he was a Naismith winner, or the thirteenth man. And he's also someone that you know, while he reached fame, at, he was a high school basketball coach that then ended up uh, in in a, in a pretty you know significant Division One level role. He never moved from his row home in Philadelphia. He he kind of always kept his roots and his humility. And the last thing is he just he just made everything personal. I get a handwritten note from him every every couple of years now. It's been a couple of years because he's he's getting older now. But um, um, so he kind of always made it personal. And uh, those are attributes I took from just, uh, you know, coach, a coach who's been you know formative for me. Do you want to comment or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you probably because so, in terms of the influence, so the people who influenced me, I, Chris, definitely, you know, my husband, and it's really for pushing and pushing me to look at different, you know, from a different lens uh, to get on the same side and understand things from a different perspective. So I love that. And again, I feel like me as a human, you know, as a professional, it just made me so much better. And then, you know, I had a string of really tough and awesome demanding bosses that made me better, uh, again, from the critical standpoint to uh, that, that pushed, you know, my thinking pushed, you know, what I thought was possible to achieve. So I always kind of challenge, you know, always welcome those environments. And then on the book front, um, gosh, I go through them. So, you know, every month there's a favorite one. So the one I'll probably land on right now, the two that's been swirling probably on the topics we discussed, one is the team of teams by General Stanley McChrystal. And that's really, I feel like, spoke to me when I think about the complexity of our world and how to motivate, engage, you know, the teams to really be purposeful and really where purpose is, you know, Trump's procedure, because you can't script everything, you know, so thinking more in principles, kind of principle-based type of approach uh, really spoke to me. And uh, I would say uh, the book's on trust. You know, I'm really passionate about the topic of trust. So the Trusted um, Advisor uh, book uh, by um, Charles Green you yeah. know, is is really, I think, wonderful and uh, opened up a whole boatload of relationships for us. So. That's great. That's great. Stephen Covey also wrote a great book called The Speed of Trust about how yeah, trust accelerates yeah, things. Brought, yeah, you know, I actually brought, um, well, speaking of pushing each other, so Chris, you know, brought... Um, Franklin Covey to do uh, training for his sales teams over his career. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I listened to the content of what they're, what they're, we're teaching, I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. He's like, you should be doing this for procurement because it's like, it's the same concept. You go and you build relationships with your internal clients, understand the business, what's the end in mind, et cetera, move off the solution. You know, some of the beautiful, beautiful principles, you know, taught. So I actually brought, um, Franklin Covey to do the training for procurement and achieving both objective of looking at things from different perspective, but also gain amazing skills. That's wonderful. That's great. Chris and D, if, uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, maybe they've heard, maybe they want to hire you or maybe they have questions. Is that okay? And what's your preferred to the point of personal and not, uh, not casting too wide a net, but what's your preferred mechanism for, for outreach, uh, for people that are listening to get in touch? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways. One is we we did uh, we, we've taken this next step, sort of in taking and creating 
a blog page, a website called Move Same Side uh, is the name of it. And that's where you can learn a little bit more about the movement we're driving. Uh, there's a way to get in touch with us through that. Uh, number one, LinkedIn. Uh, of course, we both have profiles, and you can connect through Move Same Side to our LinkedIn profiles. That's been our, our, our you know, good source for us to build those networks. We love uh, as a starting point just having this conversation. Uh, you know, whether it's companies who are struggling with a relationship, we've helped advise on how to improve that relationship. If it's sales organizations that are looking to you know, inject a different type of thinking. We can, we can, you know, so, so the best place to start would be just, Hey, invite us to have a conversation with your sales organization, or even with you and your customer. We've, we've done, we've done work like that. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say, um, my email is Chris at E sellis, E S E L L A S.com always available through their email as well. And, and I'll, if, if someone wants to get in touch with Donna, have them come through me. And if it's, if it's relevant for, um, that when we can feel we can be helpful to what they're trying to do, then I'll absolutely um, get you know get Don engaged, and we'll both engage. That sounds great, Chris Donna. Thanks so much for joining us on the Sales Hacker Podcast. We'll talk to you in a couple of days for Friday Fundamentals. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you, you, Sam. Thanks for the opportunity. Hey, everybody! It's Sam Jacobs. This is Sam's Corner. Really interesting interview with Chris and Dee Donato, the husband and wife team that are part of the same side movement, trying to connect buyers and sellers, procurement specifically and sellers. And Dee has a very senior position on the procurement team at American Express, and Chris is a longtime enterprise seller. I think I think we heard a couple things in there that are probably pretty interesting uh, for us to, to consider, and we'll talk about them this coming Friday as well. But First of all, just the idea of transparency. That's I think that's a big one for everybody to, to think about, especially in enterprise sales. You have to understand that the remit of the procurement team is to provide market intelligence and to provide transparency on the market ecosystem. It is not their job to take your offer, run it through you know, to final red lines and get everything signed without understanding what the rest of the market is doing. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they're your adversary. That means that they can be your ally if you treat them as such. So go to procurement, bring them insights, bring them intelligence, bring them information. If you can do that, you can be an ally to procurement. Also bring them into the fold earlier in the process and make sure they're part of the process, not something that you sort of encounter later on in the process. I think if you do those things, you'll have a lot more success. One more quick tidbit, just to make sure that we all remember it. You receive an RFP and you know, there's two types of RFPs. There is an RFP that is a genuine RFP. And uh, if you, if there's anybody out there that doesn't know what it stands for, it's a request for proposal. So a, a company will say, this is a requirement, this is a business problem that we have, and we're articulating the way that we want it solved. And you'll, as a vendor, you will receive that RFP. Now there's two types and I've been involved in both types. One of the types is a true RFP, meaning it's a truly competitive process. They have not predetermined the winner. And in that case, that's an opportunity to potentially win some business. There's another one where the somebody in the organization, based on some of the procurement factors I just talked about, is paying lip service to the idea of a competitive process, but they're not they're not really engaged in a competitive process and they don't really want a competitive process because, of course, it's a pain in the ass. And so in that case, you need some tricks. You need some tactics to understand and try to tell the difference. Now, if you don't know the difference at all, that's obviously one big red sign, right? Because sometimes the vendor is part of drafting the RFP. And in that case, you know that it's not a competitive RFP because you help write it. Those are obviously the very best kind. But what Chris told us uh, in today's conversation is if you can't get the right level of access back, if you have questions or if you want to deepen your relationships in the organization and you're being prevented from getting access to other folks in the organization, if you have questions about requirements or you want to understand deeper about why certain things in the RFP were stated as they were and they refuse to answer those questions, basically if you're being kept in the dark, that's a red flag. And red flags can be a signal that you should abort the RFP process completely and not compete because the act of completing an RFP or an RFI is the act of documenting your business strategy and your competitive differentiation. So do that, but do it very intentionally and be careful and cautious and use tactics, use, use some heuristics to understand when you're in the good kind of RFP and when you're in the bad kind of RFP. 
at any rate, this has been Sam's Corner. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you'll find us, of course, on uh, on iTunes or Google Play or anywhere that you receive and hear your podcasts. Uh, we know you're kind of a big deal. So if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your peers on LinkedIn, Twitter, or elsewhere. And if you've got a great idea or guest or feedback, get in touch with me. Find me on Twitter at Sam F. Jacobs. I recently deleted Twitter from my phone, so I may not be as responsive. I'm trying. It was making me angry, and I'm trying to be less angry. So one place I'm not as angry as LinkedIn, find me on linkedin.com slash the word in and then slash Sam F. Jacobs. We'd love to hear from you. Once again, big shout out to our sponsors for this episode, Chorus, the leading conversation intelligence platform for high growth sales teams and outreach the leading sales engagement platform. I hope to see you in San Diego for Unleash. SHPod is the code. Talk to you next time.